Thank you and welcome to another episode of Geek USA, an all things nerd podcast where the Trekkie meets the techie. My name is James. And my name is Carl. And this week, we're going to talk about the record that is perhaps Dream Theater's finest hour Scenes from a Memory. All right, Carl, this week we are discussing what is in many fans' eyes Dream Theater's finest hour, Scenes from a Memory. What are your thoughts on Scenes from a Memory? Uh, it was great. I think it was it was like the third was the uh, third album I owned, I think, by them. I think. Either way, um, it was the first one that I bought brand new when it came out. I remember that. And Same I, here. We didn't see them live before this, so I think that this started – the like the five or six times that I would wind up seeing them live too, um, was was getting this album and the live recording for it was fantastic too. So no, fantastic album. Um, it it might very well be their finest hour if you take like the culmination of their whole career. This might be the best representation of what they've done prior and after. But um, it's great. I I enjoyed preparing for this by listening to it five you know times in the last week. Yeah, it's interesting to me, like, Scenes from a Memory holds two specific distinctions for me. A, it's, like you said, it's the first record, <clears throat> like, I actually, you know, I cut class and went and bought it. Like, it, it was out on a Tuesday, and it was, like, the first Dream Theater record I was able to go and purchase. Uh, even though F- Falling into Infinity came out and I was a fan, I didn't kind of stumble onto that until, you know, a few months after it came out. Uh, and then the second thing is, I... I was unaware at the time, I think we both were, uh, of the tumultuous period that led up to its creation because the internet wasn't really what it is now in 1998, no, 1999. So, so I just bought the record and listened to it and was like, holy crap. But now looking back, I realize that like it is a huge, successful kind of reaffirmation of everything they were that I was completely unaware of. We went and saw them on tour. We saw this tour like a lot of people did. And, they just came out and played an amazing set and and just killed it and i had no idea at the time you know that fans were so kind of uh not against it just the reaction to falling into infinity in that period was lost upon me i just thought it was a great record and i didn't realize until years later as you get on the forums and stuff and you talk to like-minded fans you're like oh that was a rough period for them and but i wasn't aware of it at the time so looking back you know, this is, you said this is like the third record and like the first time you saw them. Do you, do you feel differently about it now or has it aged well with you? Oh, I don't feel any different about it. And, uh, it's aged, uh, with me great. Um, there, I mean, there are some things about it that maybe I liked at the time that I don't as much like now and vice versa. But I mean, I, I loved it when it came out and I still love it now. There's no, there's there's no gain or loss for me. It's it's in my top five of their albums, and it, it's it's been there the whole time. So for those who aren't aware or or maybe aren't as familiar with this period of the band, uh, you know we've really outlined the history up to this point on previous podcasts. But a quick update would be that the band, you know, prior to recording "Falling Into Infinity," Kevin Moore, original keyboard player, leaves, and the band secures the. Uh, enlist the services of Derek Sherinian, tours with him. You know, upon the completion of that whole cycle, and this is documented very well in various forms, but basically Mike Portnoy says he wants to quit the band. He's unhappy. He felt record company pressure and other things were kind of sending the band away from from what he wanted to be doing, and he wanted more control. The band conceded and said, you know what, you're right, the 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 big record company album didn't really do anything for us. The tour wasn't all that great. We're going to, we're going to acquiesce and and you know kind of go along with your pe- plan here. And part of that was to switch keyboard players. So, uh, you know, not to make it a he said she said, but basically, you know, they let Derek Sherinian go, and he's a stand up guy, and he's always been very gracious to them in interviews and such when brought up the topic. But 
they bring back to the fold Jordan Rudis. So, Carl, you are probably much more sensitive to this topic than than most people I know because you're an amazing keyboard player and you have thoughts on keyboard players. So, <laughs> what what did Dream Theater lose and what did Dream Theater gain with this change in lineup? I think I think I'm a marginally okay keyboard player, but thank you very much, Jim. Um, what they lost was some groove and some jam. You know, they they lost. Um, a little looseness, you know. They were they had a they had a they were very loose with Derek Sherinian and, and the music that they created around that time kinda had that vibe. And it was it was like it was more cool than it was like nerdy. Um where, you know, Kevin Moore was more artsy than it was nerdy. Jordan Rudis, like straight up like nerd leveled the band plus twenty. Um is his technical proficiency and I don't know maybe I don't know if you know, he really was technically more proficient than uh, Derek Sherinian, and Sherinian just liked to play, the, you know, the groove and the vibe that he played. But well, I think he was more um, classically proficient. He could play repertoire. I mean, that was probably yeah. the case. He's a Juilliard yeah, guy, so. Yeah, I don't know if Jordan Rudis could boogie or could boogie very well, but um, I, I know that uh, he, what we kind of gained was like a second John Pertucci on a different instrument, yes, and you're either going to cool. love that because you, you you think that's awesome, or you're gonna hate it because you're like we already have one of them. Um, you get more of the same skill level dueling solos and things like that. So the uh, the nickname the wizard um, is very well earned. He is he is pretty much just that. Well, and so on this record, you get a a more toned down version of what you're going to see in the future because this was his first kind of working with them outside of the two Liquid Tension experiment albums. He had never really played with the band and Liquid Tension wasn't really much of a composition environment. It was more of a jam and let's record. So the band decides that they're going to, not only are they going to make a new record with Jordan Rudis, but they're going to make a concept album. They felt like it was finally time and they had this this kind of long-winded epic song they never really got around to finishing floating around metropolis part two which they had been tooling with for years and they decided to take that song and maybe stretch it out and develop it into a record kind of in the vein of uh, a classic concept record the wall misplaced childhood from Rillian, you know L- lamb lies down on broadway they wanted to 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 kind of reach to those heights which is you know looking back that's a pretty ballsy thing to do in 1999 so it's not it's certainly not what was in vogue at that point when, you know, bands like Limp Bizkit and Linkin Park are tearing up the charts, we're going to go make a, <laughs> you know, a concept record. So, but they do. Limp Bizkit they, didn't make a concept album? He didn't? No. Well, maybe no? actually, maybe that Chocolate actually Starfish. Didn't, didn't Wes, I think Wes Borland actually did though, didn't he? In that <laughs> he other have, yes. stupid, horrible band he was in? Many anyway. bands he was in. <laughs> so the band goes in the studio and writes and records scenes from a memory. So Carl, at the time when it came out, I remember being, this was a good example of a record that grew. I listened to it all the way through and was like, eh, I hear a couple songs and it's a lot of stuff. And like five years later, I was still listening to it and still picking stuff up and still being blown away by it. And like you said, even preparing for this podcast, I was listening to the record and still really appreciating elements that that I didn't even really notice the first time. It definitely was not something you just put on and listen to and get. It was a growing album. What did what how do you sum up scenes from memory just from that initial experience? Um my initial experience I was just completely blown away from uh the first track all the way on through to the end of it. And that never you know that never um that never went away. I, I I'm actually pretty blown away by it. Um, like almost every time I listen to it and I'm, I'm listening to it for different purposes and I'm really dissecting now and trying to, and trying to form opinions on topics I think we'll, we'll touch on. But for the most part, um, I just excited about this album as I was when I first heard it, which is kind of rare for me. I get sick of stuff pretty quick because when I get into something, I play it to death. So, um, for me to kind of stick with and be that excited about, it's pretty rare, but fantastic. And the st- the story is not stale. Like I'll still go back and listen to um, Operation Mind Crime and think, okay, this is a little cheesy now, but the riffs are awesome. So who gives a crap, right? Um, yes, th- this is a little different. Like it- it's actually, I can concept albums don't stick with me as far as the concept goes. That that's the part that always gets stale really quick. I don't seem to notice that as much with this. So um, I think they kind of did that pretty well. Well, and that's that's kind of going to lead us right into the next thing I wanted to touch upon. So I am not, 
I'm not a huge fan of concept records. I feel like most, if not all, concept records are bloated and would be a much better listening experience if kind of trimmed down. Uh, and since most concept records feel like really, or feature really like highbrow, like intense, like interconnected lyrical themes, I often feel like, why not just write a book? Like I'm not getting the depth that I would get out of a book at the sacrifice of decent songwriting. But every now and then, and so, ex you know, examples like Quadrophenia, like all the classics are great because they're great. But there's a lot of prog bands that just make concept records that I just shake my head and go, you're what? And yeah. I was worried about that with this. I knew it was a concept record from the second I flipped over the CD case and saw like the, you just were like, oh. And then you put it on and it's like tick, tock, and you know, you kind of have the opening track regression, uh, which, you know, basically sets the table uh, for our main character, Nicholas, who is basically going through, you know, regression therapy and exploring past lives. Uh, he, he basically learns that he was murdered and that in a past life he was some chick named victoria which will all become much more important later how did you feel about this kind of going track by track how did you feel about this opening do you feel like it sets the table are you a fan of these kind of interlude things yeah it sets the table pretty good i mean i skip it all the time um exactly and that's not to say because it's <laughs> because it's bad um it's just it's uh and <laughs> And you, I mean, you get that if you're going to do a story or a concept, you almost have to do that. I don't know if there is an awesome, I don't think that there's one like concept album that just, you know, grabs me from the first track that way. It's, it's a good listen though. Um, and it does kind of set the story up even, you know, it might be a little lame. Um, no one's ever going to say, Hey, I really want to listen to regression, you know, <laughs> um, silent man, maybe, but no one's going to be like, yeah, regression, that track's awesome. I think people just forget about it, but, um, it, it, it sets the story up just fine, but listen to it once and never listen to it again. It's, it's you know, I'm putting this dude under, he's, he's being hypnotized, blah, 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 rest of the album starts. <laughs> exactly, and I, I'm pretty sure the first time I listened to the record, I got three seconds into this and just skipped it because I was like, I don't want to hear any <laughs> tracks. And it took a while for the lyrical content to click because you do really need to know that this guy named Nicholas is used to be this chick named Victoria. Otherwise, none of it makes any sense. So... Uh, if you're going to listen to the record for the first time, you should listen to it all the way through. It's kind of hard to make sense of the lyrics. That being said, regression leads us into the first proper track, which is an instrumental, Overture 1928. Carl, we were talking about Hell's Kitchen in the last podcast, you know, with Falling into Infinity. And we both discussed how it was an example of everything that's right about an instrumental in a song. And this is another one of those. I, I feel like I might put this right up there. I love, love, love Overture 1928. It's everything it, like an overture should be. It's not 20 minutes. It's not bloated. It's trim. It has some of the first thing we notice is John Petrucci's like playing is already on another level. Uh, he's He's definitely kind of made some changes to his rig and... I love his guitar tone. I love everything about it. Talk to me about this song. Yeah, it's it's a straight up perfect track. It, and in fact, um, you know, it might be, it might be the only perfect track that, in my opinion, on the whole album. Um, it, it's fantastic. It it kind of touches on a little bit of everything that's going to go on with this album. Kind of shows off um, his and uh, Petrucci's and Jordan Rudis is playing. A bit, and Jordan yes. Rudis is obviously going to be very important to this album for many reasons. Um, kind of doing a lot of things thematically, if if not so much, you know, um, artsy fartsy, you know. Uh, but no, fantastic track. You don't really get too much better than this with instrumentals, except the other instrumental on this album is fantastic too, for albeit different reasons. But great way to, I guess, kind of kick. Even though it's the second track, it's kind. It's a great best way to kind of uh, kick off. The album, you know, and it leads it leads pretty well right into the uh, into the next into our track three, which is the first track we have with like a full you know the full group doing their thing. Yes, yeah, so that brings us to Strange Deja Vu. Now, Strange Deja Vu, from the story standpoint, is you know essentially taking the character Nicholas, and he's announcing to us the listener that you know he he believes he's being haunted by Victoria, you know his past life self, and that. You know, he needs to reveal the truth that about her murder and figure out what happened. So he, you know, he is, that's that's kind of like 
the vocal overture, so to speak. And the other cool thing about this song is you, you, you start to see what's going to happen throughout the album, which is like a lot of th- musical themes being interwoven from track to track, uh, very much in like a musical sort of way, but without it being cheesy. Like it works. This song has muscle. It has groove. That riff in the middle is freaking awesome. And mm-hmm. the band sounds like the actual recording. It's as good as Falling, but in a different way. I love the way that everything's mixed together. I love Jordan Rudis' keyboard patches for the most part on this record are really interesting and add kind of a completely different flavor. And John, uh, not John, uh, James Labrie sounds great. Like, his voice sounds full. It sounds up front in the mix. Uh, he's not singing or screaming in the stratosphere for the most part. I remember thinking, like, I wonder what that's all about. But it, it doesn't matter because it works, especially with this material. Uh, what are your thoughts on Strange Deja Vu? I think that, um, and to t- kind of touch on the sonic, kind of what it sounded, this, the sound on here seems a lot more gelled together and glued together, where, you know, Falling to Infinity, like, they're both very crisp sounding. Um, we're Falling into Infinity, aside from the reverb problem with the vocals, um, everything seems clear and, like, separate, like, not, not kind of gelled together. You can kind of still hear everything, but it's different here. Um, the heaviness, everything kind of melts together really well. And the, um, you don't really run into the problems on this album where, you know, where they kind of do with Burning My Soul, where they try to do really heavy, but it seems like whoever was recording that didn't get down tuned riffs very well, uh, didn't get that thick metal sound very well. Where on this one, it seems like everything they were trying to accomplish, they could accomplish without anything sonically seeming uh, getting in the way. Um, but Strange Deja Vu, you know, they managed to start telling the story without it sounding lyrically stupid, which isn't going to be the case the whole album. But here, for at least the first half, they do a really good job of it. Um, there's a uh, God, there's a great riff right in the middle of this yes. that I think was a Myung contribution. Yep. Great contribution, great riff, kind of like brings the song down, grooves a little bit, and then kind of everything gets brought back up into its normal pace again. And um, yeah, uh, Rudis' keyboard patches mix really well here, which is a shame because this is the last time for like 20 years that you're going to hear that. Um, and it, it sounds fantastic. So Yeah, he blends super well. The next track is a, a vocal interlude, Through My Words, which kind of serves as a... Uh, you know, an, a, a prologue to the big muscular track, Fatal Tragedy. So these two tracks combined, I think, are like where the real musical tour de force begins. It it has a really cool, very Elton John-esque uh, main riff and verse chorus part. And then there's this whole three-minute instrumental at the end that just kind of tags together a lot of these these different themes. Uh, Jordan Root is primarily just playing piano in this section, which I think... Again, I'm, I'm surprised he doesn't do more of it. It just works so well. It, it's probably, at that time, I thought it was the craziest John Petrucci guitar solo I'd ever heard. It was just insane. Like, just his playing was on a different level. And from a story standpoint, through my words and Fatal Tragedy, it's, it's you know, Nicholas essentially starting to recall memories of Victoria and kind of understanding that she, you know, she had a lover named Julian and he was drinking and gambling and so Julian's brother, Edward, was a shoulder to cry on. And he starts to think uh, upon finding a newspaper that will become the you know, lyrics for the next song. He starts to think that maybe you know, she was murdered in some sort of weird love triangle. So, Carl, talk to me about, through my words, Fatal Tragedy, this like eight-minute epic. Yeah, this uh, through my words is he kind of akin it to uh, regression a little bit. It's a little for lack of a better word it's a little lame a little, right a little it's skippable. not this yeah. hard thing but i don't actually this i think sets fatal the track fatal tragedy up so yes. well that like i almost never skip this one i mean if i'm going straight to fatal tragedy obviously you do because it's track four than five but if i'm kind of like listening through i'll, I'll just leave that one play uh fatal tragedy probably has my favorite um petrucci guitar solo in it and it's probably the um the most tasteful uh, keyboard solo lead into you know a John Petrucci solo that they do for the rest of their career, um, 
but yeah, kind of a kind of a very weighty track. You know, there's a lot of uh, it, it's 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 fairly heavy, but not in necessarily a metal way. Like you said, it's got kind of like a like an Elton John thing, only with like a little more muscle to it. Um, great tones, great recording, great performances, and you know, the, again, the lyrics as of yet as far as like trying to re- recall a story and lyrics isn't so stupid yet um it, it doesn't sound necessarily like they're telling a story like in a forced I, i'm just trying to get you know you know in that typical prog way where we, we know how to play music we don't know how to tell stories you know totally, what i mean totally um, we're not yeah we're we're not bob Seeger. you know this isn't what we do so they do a pretty good job of it though and uh Great solo work, um, great keyboard work so far, nothing to complain about. Well, and the thing I like a lot about just like the whole way that lyrics unravel on this record is that if you don't really pay attention, it doesn't really matter. The songs, the hooks, the choruses, they work within the context of the song themselves while also being a part of a bigger story. Uh, The next track, Beyond This Life, 11 minutes long this is where we really tackle a lot of the lyrical content so up to this point you know you're about a third of the way through the record you don't really have too much you guy going to therapy thinks he used to be a chick thinks he was killed blah 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 this story it literally the lyrics read as lines out of a newspaper article kind of explaining a whole lot of backstory really quickly the song also has a very cool instrumental section very frank zappa ish very like 70s prog like lots of groove and swing again you don't really hear a lot of this kind of playing from rudis later on but in this track it it, this is the track i felt like man if derek sherinian was in the band this song would have just been like off the charts cool because it's totally got like this whole like just looking for like a groove and keyboard part on it so and then from the from the story standpoint you know the the newspaper articles basically saying that you know this girl victoria was killed and that they there was witnesses and you know basically she was murdered people saw it happen so everything that nicholas was kind of assuming is now confirmed that you know he basically realizes is what what has happened and now he I, I'm kind of confused because, like the rest of the album, you kind of already know what's happening, but we'll get to that. So, thoughts on Beyond This Life? Yeah, Beyond This Life. Um, God, the first time I heard his uh, his first uh, guitar solo, I was I thought that was just like blind. Like compared to anything else he's done, I was like that is blindingly fast. And it turns out that you know he's gonna he eventually can play a lot faster. But uh, the Beyond This Life is God probably the best riff on the album. That whole opening riff, that's just freaking fantastic. But this, um, this is where we kind of start this thing where you know Jordan Rudis and uh, and uh, Pertucci will go back and forth with yes. solos in a way that I think is a little redundant. But this was like the first time that they've really done it, and I thought, well, this is freaking awesome um, because this, because I mean, you can really hear very quickly Jordan Rudis is a fantastic lead player on a keyboard, and we already know that uh, Pertucci is a fantastic lead player on a guitar um but the uh the song kind of drones on a little bit maybe maybe a little too long a little needlessly it's not as uh it's not as trim as fatal tragedy which is odd to say about an eight minute track versus an 11 minute track but um real heavy riff i i i mean they've they've done like the heavy thing but um you know the whole falling into infinity thing you know between this at that and then and here i guess burning my soul is kind of a heavy riff but you kind of get lost in the production here it's it's a it's it's kind of fast but slows down it's kind of sludgy at some points a fantastic track yeah i I couldn't agree more i i do think it yes if you kind of trim some of the instrumental at the end you might end up with maybe a better song but you know at this point i think given the context of what they're doing with the record i i just kind of forgive it the next track uh which concludes act one of our story is through her eyes drum machine acoustic guitar james labrie kind of whining and essentially you know nicholas reflecting upon you know what he had discovered which was that julian had murdered victoria and edward for having an affair this is a if there's one like really weak spot on the record this track does nothing for me i've never understood what they were thinking with this song i just think it's like the lamest track you can do ballads but i don't know (laughs) what tell me i'm wrong tell me that this is a great song 
No, you're you're right. The song blows, and uh, I just skip it every time. Um, I think for <laughs> <laughs> I li- <laughs> I uh, I listened to uh, like regression, but I think when I first had this album, I think I got like halfway through this one. I was like, this is no skip. Don't I don't need to know. I was like, yeah, they probably have to say something about the story or something like that, but I. I wasn't really interested at all. I'd skip this, go, uh, just skip this, uh, you know, strap your balls on and go right to the next track. Yeah, exactly. And so the next track, if, if there was a standout track on this album, it might be this one. This is, this is the song that <clears throat> probably captured my, my attention with dream theater and really like held on for a long time. This song I think is everything I love about this band in an epic. It's a 13 minute long song called home. Uh, covers a lot of ground lyrically with the story, covers a, a lot of ground musically, has a very interesting Tool-esque riff, has a very cool coda at the end with a really cool instrumental section, has a great, great performance by James Labrie. It might be his best performance on the album. He is in full-on, like, you know, dramatic singing mode. He's really, like, selling the story of the record and it's kind of interesting carl and i never really realized it until i like started to flip through the lyrics while listening to it back in the day that like each verse is kind of telling a different piece of the story you know like the first verse is talking about julian and his you know addictions and you know cocaine and whatnot there's references there and then then there's a section where his brother's talking about feeling guilty because he's you know cheating on his dude with his dude's wife or girlfriend or whatever and and then it kind of like encapsulates both of those sides back and forth so i can't say enough about this song i love everything about it the only criticism i have if there is a criticism for home is that it is kind of a goofy transition into the solos and middle section like it it very much feels like a cut and paste like yes but whatever and it works in this band at this point they this is the beginning they're going to start just doing that on every song like what instrumental here you know like doesn't matter just punch it in and we'll we'll put a fill real quick before it i know what are your thoughts on home it, yeah, that that um that middle part solo thing kind of works here because here for the band it's a little, little bit unique. Um, where going forward, it's it's going to be it's gonna like I said, it's gonna be that thing that you either love because you think it's great or you hate it because you're like I you just don't like it. Um, but no, home is fantastic. The um the the if it's a little more of an upper pace song the whole time. If there's not aside from the middle part transitioning into the solos, there isn't much of a slowdown to it. Um, the lyrics work really well. Uh, Labrie singing, you know, they don't do the stratosphere thing almost on this album at all, but it really doesn't matter because his voice, it's so well recorded compared to the last album. And it's so strong that you just don't even notice it. It really fits in with the tracks very well. And this is probably the, the biggest, um, uh, and best example of it. Uh, John's guitar solo here is fantastic. Um, Jordan's keyboard solo is fantastic too. So again, this is another one of those tracks that's borderline perfect, um, and you know this is one of the highlights of the album. Yeah, it's definitely it's definitely a highlight. Do you? I mean, are you as high on it? Do you feel like it's the strongest song in the album, or are you not? No, I I think um, my, my opinion, uh, "Fatal Tragedy," I think is the strongest tune on the album. I mean, this isn't far off though. I mean, it's it's not. I think the the solo wing's a little redundant because again, like I already I already like that you guys have a John Pertucci. I don't need a John Pertucci playing a different instrument, but it's still good. Like I can't say that it's bad if it's if it's your if it's your cup of tea. You're gonna want to drink ten of these, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the next track is the Marathon Instrumental Dance of Eternity. Now, I I like Overture 1928 a lot. I just said it was one of the best instrumentals ever. This song is. I, if it was four minutes long, it would be perfect. It just, I've never understood this part of Dream Theater. The din and din and it just over and over and just, it just one thing after another. And it's cool. And if you're into this kind of thing, and this is probably like that liquid tension experiment sort of, you know, just full on tour de force instrumentals, then this song is that. And this is an example of a song that is you know so over the top busy they're they're taking that middle section of the the original song metropolis and putting it on steroids so i'm not as high on this song but carl talk to me about dance of eternity what what is what is going on that's really good here 
It's probably great that you and I are actually going to disagree on something for once. I love this track. I think it's really? my uh it's it might be my like second favorite track on the album. I love like the noodling and it's not like noodling like they're soloing the whole time. Um it, I I love it and uh I love um I love poor, um Myung's like distortion bass solo breakdown thing kind of like right in the middle of it. I think it's fantastic. So this track is probably one of my favorites. If you like Man, if you do like like that noodling thing that they do, this is probably the best um, the best place for it. It's it's great. Um, this is one of the tracks I'm the most excited to listen to when we get here. Um, and they're not like they're not soloing all over. The thing I get sick of is he putting a solo in places where a solo doesn't have to be, or doubling a solo just because Petrucci had one. You got to give Rudis one, or vice versa. Um, to me, this is all just tasteful slash not tasteful song noodling which is fantastic yeah it's definitely an example of the band writing an instrumental as opposed to just here's a bunch of riffs now solo on top of it yeah it's yeah it's definitely it's definitely good the this song kind of goes right into one last time which i feel like is was kind of just meant to be an interlude but it's way more fleshed out and it's super i love this track i love how i love how it kind of builds and builds and builds and drops into this very like majestic like thing at the end it just it really works the only thing i don't like about this track is it's not like six minutes because i really feel like it was one of those they probably just meant it to be like a a regression type thing and then it you know it it just it just works so well and james labrie again a really good vocal performance a lot of these slower songs kind of put his vocals right in front of the mix and he he just perfectly like you know in in regards to tone and enunciation like just a beautiful voice you know, very much singing in his comfort zone, which I think also helps. Like, like all of the songs feel like a little bit down in register and a little bit more doable for him. And now, Carl, talk to me about this song. Are you high on one last time? Yeah, I, I really dig the tune. Um, I I don't notice that necessarily that it's not longer or that it's kind of a short tune. But I mean, they are kind of running out of minutes here for a for what a CD can do. But um, it's good. It, it's a good listen. They I don't know if. Um, I will, they do it live here or there, and I think the one recording I have in my head is kind of ridiculously funny, but um, it, it leads right into Spirit Carries On very well. It's it's a it's an integral part of the story, but of course the the song itself is still pretty good. So not necessarily noticing any clunkiness, except you know we get through her eyes. But beyond that, this is where you kind of bring the album down a little bit, but you kind of do it the right way. Uh, a little more tolerable, tasteful song, great singing, great ending of the tune, kind of wraps wraps it up pretty good. As opposed to Through Her Eyes, which kind of just drones on and makes you you know, roll your eyes, just kind of wishing it was yeah. over. <laughs> so, yeah, talk to me. So, One Last Time goes into Spirit Carries On. Now, essentially, at this point, you have this character kind of saying goodbye to his past life. He has solved the murder. You know, it was it was bad news, but it's over. And he has figured out what happened, and he's letting go of these memories. This song is, it, it's it's got that Pink Floyd kind of gospel tinge almost. It's not a power ballad. They they definitely steer clear of that. My only complaint with Spirit Carries On uh, is that I I don't. It's a very vanilla chord progression. It doesn't really. It's never really caught my ears. I get that it's telling a very integral piece of the story, and it's meant to be a very spiritual piece. And John Petrucci's guitar solo is. Very David Gilmour esque. It's a very cool moment, uh, but I. It's a good song. I don't skip it, but I don't know that I've ever felt this was on par with maybe some of their their other like ballads. How do you feel about this track? This is one of those tunes where I only um, like. I like it. I, I kind of agree with you, but for some reason, like when I listen to the score version. I want to listen to it over and over again, and when I listen to the album version, I'm not as much into it. I yeah, I can't give you a good reason as to why. Like it's just the same freaking song, but um, I like it live more than I like it on the album. I don't have a practical reason to explain that. Um, it is a good tune, as much as I don't, I don't get super excited to hear it on the album. I mean, it's not nearly as bad as Finally Free. And a lot of the lyrics, I mean, it's it's again like it's they all you know Portnoy, Miyoung. Labrie, Petrucci, all of them tackle lyrics. They kind of took the story and split it up. And, you know, this is Petrucci's, one of his contributions. And, you know, like, safe in the light that surrounds you. Like, just a lot of the lyrics, whether it, you're listening to it as part of the story or you're just listening to it as a song, it's it's very poetically told. 
Uh, and I, I again, I think that really helps because if I tell you what the album's about, I think it sounds interesting. It, it, it reads like the back of like maybe a, you know, a mystery thriller book. And that the fact that they're able to kind of take that and then expound upon it and make it a little bit more poetic, I think makes it feel more timeless. And the record already kind of feels timeless because we're talking about, you know, we're talking about these kind of high-minded things that aren't tethered to like technology or war or dystopia. It's talking about somebody who died and, you know, and like a, you know, reincarnation and those kind of things, which I think are just a little bit more, a little out of the realm of what metal bands are typically talking about on these kinds of records. Uh, Spirit carries on, leads us to finally free. Now, finally free is, is essentially the end of the record. And it kind of has three distinct parts. You know, it has the, the opening, which is just a song with a lot of exposition, and then it has this kind of build up in the middle, and then the final outro, uh, which kind of reveals how the story ends. And spoiler alert for those who haven't checked this out in the last 18 years since it was released Nicholas has it wrong. So, you know, Nicholas, the song starts off with, you know, kind of Edward. Uh, having the flashback to Edward, and it wasn't what you thought it was. Yes, Victoria was having an affair with her brother, but Edward wanted it to be more, and she said, I can't do this. He's a struggling alcoholic. I'm going to go back to him. So Edward kills the both of them. Then he hangs around, and he is the witness that talks to the newspaper and the police. So she, Nicholas had it very wrong because he goes home and, you know, the end of the record is led to believe that the hypnotherapist, who is the reincarnated soul of Edward, kills him. Uh, thus, you know, kind of ending ending the story in a, in a twist. And I don't know that you would get all that if the band hadn't basically said all of that in interviews over the years, because it's kind of a little hard to follow. But it makes sense. Oh, and it definitely makes the story a little bit cooler. So, Carl, how do you feel about Finally Free? Do you do you like the twist in the story and all of that? No, it's a good twist for a story. I just think the song, it's like, this is a horrible album closer. Um, really? So you're not a fan? I, well, no, I like the song. I just don't like it closing on an album. Story-wise, it kind of has to. I mean, if I were to, like, re-orient like orient the track listing on this album, the story wouldn't make any sense. No. But so I mean it kinda has to go there. But I, I think that if I had to um if I if I had to pick like kind of like a lame way to close an album, like you get all right. So you get home and then the dance of eternity. And then you get one last time, which is a good tune. You get Spirit Carries On, which is a good tune. Then you get finally three, which again it's a good tune. But it's like this album is really front heavy with the awesome tracks. Um, and I wouldn't necessarily say front heavy. I mean, it's more than like the first half of the mm-hmm. album. But then it's like the the last three in a row are kind of like, eh, mm, mm, okay. Um, but story wise, it's it's fantastic. It's not it's not cheesy. At least it's not overly cheesy. It's not something that like I notice. And you're right. I I didn't quite get all that until a few years gone down the road. But um, it, it's not bad. You know, it's it's good. I just I hate it closing out the album. So, yeah, so that's an interesting point. If you were going to re-track the album or rearrange the tracks, how what would you have closing the album? I'd probably have Home closing the album. Ah, oh, that's that would be an epic, which, yeah. 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 And now, which, you know, we're closing out the album with the middle of the story, so, again, probably well, wouldn't work. But as far as the song goes, that's probably what I would have closed That's it one of the problems with, with concept records. You know, you get to the point where you're be kind of becoming a slave to the story, and you're ham-fisting chunks of lyrics into songs that maybe don't belong there because you have to, because it doesn't make sense without it. I mean, if the story was just... And I get it. Like, if it was just that this guy remembers that he used to be a chick and the chick had an affair with the dude's brother and the dude killed both of them. If that was the story, it would be like, oh, okay. So there had, you know, the fact that there's a twist and that all makes sense and it it reads as a much better story. But if these were just songs with, like, different lyrics, the record would still be just as amazing. Uh, And I think that maybe the arrangements of some of the songs would be, you know, better for it. But that's that's a minor gripe, and it is what it is. It's It's a concept record, and I will concede that as a concept it works and it works a lot better than a lot of other concept records i agree with you like operation mind crime is great the story's kind of stupid it doesn't matter i love sweet sister mary <laughs> yeah. i don't get what the song's about i don't really care it's a great song it's a great vocal performance you know at least this one i kind of like think oh that's interesting I, I like these lyrics you know so yeah and it's 
this is kind of in that same vein. Uh, the difference is, is that like with Operation Mindcrime, I feel like it just gets better as you go along. Like the last half of that record is three times as good as the first half. Like it just gets better and better and better. Uh, I have a completely different outlook on that. I think the, I think the, that's, I, I get the same problem with mind crime as I do with the scenes too. Oh, really? Yeah. I don't really dig the last half of the album. Wow. So you're not a fan of like, I don't believe in love or breaking the silence. No, I mean, I'm, I like, I like the songs. I just don't think it's nearly like we get through the, like, so like you get, um, I remember now all the way through the needle eye. So that's like eight or nine tracks, right? Mm hmm. After that, it's good, but Electric Requiem kind of blows. Oh, I love that um, track. I don't believe in... I know you do. <laughs> um, it's it's the most Rage for Order track on the album, yes. hence I know Oh, and you love happen it. to know I'm a... But, like, yeah. yes. But we get um, where, you know, the first half of the album is kind of like, you know, the warning only, you know, which is one of my favorites. But we get the Needle Eyes, maybe Electric Requiem, which I don't like, Breaking the Silence, I, I Don't Believe in Love, or I might have the order messed up. And those are two okay tunes, but then we get the empty room and waiting for 22 we close out with eyes of a stranger so it's like i get like a song i like a noise track that i think is stupid two okay songs two stupid tracks and then like one okay well, song fair enough i think i think what we've just revealed to our audience is that a queen's series similar to this dream theater series is is going to come <laughs> up because you are right i if you get me on the topic of any of those first five records i even six i'll say i can just go and go and go because it just god yes. those are yes so but as it compares to this album i think i feel like same idea great record maybe flawed but as a concept record one of the best you know oh yeah so we've i think it was voted that way i think that there have been um i think rolling stones or somebody there's there were some articles where you know it's it, i think it gets rated very high as far as um as concept albums and progressive rock yeah, and I I get why because this this works on so many levels. And like I said, I mean I didn't I didn't get that whole part at the end that the like I was watching. I think I was watching live scenes and there's the commentary track, right? And that's when they're like, oh, and that's when so and so kills her or kills him. And I was like, what? That's how that ends? Oh, that makes way more sense. I would never have picked that up if they hadn't said it. It doesn't matter. It the 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 record works. It's cool. I like the fact that, like, the static, they kind of begin this thing that they do for the next four records where, like, the static of the ending of Finally Free is the same static that leads into, you know, the glass prison and then so on and so forth. Like, they, they kind of tether the records together. I, I always thought that was a clever thing uh, to do. So do you have, looking back, do you have thoughts on everybody's uh, performances. Do you have a favorite Mike Portnoy performance or, or Myung performance or Petrucci performance on this record? Yeah, for um for Portnoy, I am um, I'm gonna take home. I think that uh he, it, it, I mean the riffs and everything are it's a it's a kind of a more exciting song that kind of like kind of pushes the whole way. And I think the reason that it pushes the way it does is because Mike Portnoy, he's kind of driving it. Um. For bass, I just I love Myung's bass playing all over um, Dance of Eternity, and uh, specifically that little breakdown that he gets is is freaking great. Uh, Pertucci, my the favorite for, from him is um, Fatal Tragedy. I think the solo in that one's awesome. I love him in it. And um, as much as it's not my favorite tune, Labrie sings the hell out of Spirit Carries On. Yes, he and, does. Uh, yeah, yeah. To me, that stands out uh, a great deal. Um, for Rudis. I hate to say this, but my favorite moments from him are the ones where you hardly notice he's there. <laughs> um, and uh, I didn't, I didn't think so much that way at the time when the album came out. But now I'm just so sick. My of favorite moments are when he's his not style. <laughs> <laughs> But I think that um, between Overture and Strange uh, Deja Vu, I, I think it's really tasteful and kind of like in the pocket there. He does. He, here's the thing. He does a really great job on that through Fatal Tragedy too. Um, I just think his lead work in Fatal Tragedy, each lead line he does in Fatal Tragedy is practically identical to themselves and i i it just sounds um sounds kind of lazy but like the the everything he does for like the entirety other of the song when he's not playing the lead stuff is perfect so i don't know he's he's hit or miss with me yeah that's i mean that's completely fair i think if i was going to i'll follow you know follow in suit with you i'll, I'll say mike portnoy 
I have to agree with you. I think Home is really, especially the whole instrumental coda at the end. It's just so fun to listen to. Uh, a lot of yeah. because of how his drums are recorded and how upfront they are on the mix. He's really driving, you know, what's happening there. Uh, for Rudis, you know, there's a set part in Overture 1928 right near the end where he's doing this kind of like, like keyboard thing on top and then he like kind of just hits this really high note and just holds it on top as the whole band crashes down into the final riff and it's just i always think that's such a cool moment it's so perfect it's not it's not a circus thing it's not it's just the perfect note at that time and i wish there was more of that <laughs> from him i really myung i'll sure he's he's great on the whole thing i i love the section in strange deja vu where the band cuts out and he kind of does this big slide right back into the kind of the breaking the silence sort of riff where they're they're just riding on the bass. Yeah. And, oh, man, Petrucci. You know, I will tell you that I think that... You can't really go wrong with him on any track. It's, he's he's kind of hard to nail this down. This and the record that follows Six Degrees, I feel represent the peak of his playing. I, I'm not a big fan of his playing anymore. I think he has lost the ability to be, to edit himself. Like, he just doesn't, and it doesn't do anything for me, but at this point in his career, he was... The muscles do his thinking for him when he yeah, plays. totally. And any of these solos, I would probably say that... It's funny, like, actually, I don't really like his solo at home. It's not... But I, I would probably say the Fatal Tragedy solo is just just stupid good. And Labrie, you know, Carl, I would tell you, and we might have this podcast at the end of this whole run... I think Home might be my favorite James Labrie performance ever on anything he's done, on like the 30 records he's sung on. I think that song is so driven by his ability to kind of like change the character of his voice, depending on who's singing the lines. It, it's a good point. I, it gives me goosebumps, and I've heard it 500 times. Like, I listened to it a few days ago. I was driving, and it was like giving me goosebumps. And I was like, this is blowing my mind, because like, I know there's no surprise here. I know this song inside and out. And that just that says a lot about the record. Where does Scenes from a Memory sit for you now? You you look at the band's catalog, you look at their 13 soon to be 14 records. Where do you put this one? Is it at the top of the pile? Is it in the middle of the pile? Yeah, very much at the top of the pile. Um I it's always in my top 5 and I hate to sound like that guy, but my top 5 is essentially the first you know, five records. <laughs> images, yeah. Awake, Falling, uh, Scenes, and then Six Degrees in, in, in some other order. So for take that for what it's worth. Maybe, maybe it's just my personality and I'm turning into that old guy. But um, no, it's it's at the top of the pile for sure for me. Yeah, I, I, want, I would want to say that it's a little bit farther down because I, I do feel like if I'm really like going to listen to the record, like if I'm driving – Somewhere, I'm probably only listening to eight of the 12 tracks. And I feel like if you're only going to listen to two-thirds of the album's tracks, how can it be in your top five? But that being said, I think the record, it, it's because of the kind of the kind of record it is. It's not always the same eight tracks I'm listening to, so that says something. I, this record is, I'm always in the mood for the band when they're doing this. So it's always going to be in that like go-to pile of, like, I want to listen to some Dream Theater and so I'm going to listen to, you know, I'm not, I don't want to be challenged. I don't want it to be boring. I don't want to listen to the astonishing and want to kill myself. I'm going to listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's probably in my top five or six. I, I put Octavarium up there too. I've actually really, even the dumb songs on Octavarium, like These Walls, I like listening to that song. It's a cool song. It's dumb. It sounds like a Chevelle song or something. But, it's, <laughs> but I enjoy listening to it. Why did they have that? What's the track? Oh, the the answer lies within. Why is that the second song on that record? God only knows. It's the stupidest song, but I listen to it. I like it. I like that there's birds chirping in the beginning of it. It's the dumbest song I've ever heard, but <laughs> but but I like listening to it. And this is kind of the same thing. Like I I just enjoy it. You know, there's not. It doesn't have to be anything more than that. <clears throat> so, looking back, this was the first album that the band makes with Jordan Rudis. The band produces the record themselves this is also a first how do you think the album fares sonically do you like the way it's produced do you think they did a good job no they did a fantastic job it's probably to date for them the best sounding album that they've done better than six degrees um 
to date, like in oh, their oh, in their yes. career so gotcha. far. It, yeah, no, I think Six Degrees is the best sounding one that they've done ever. Um, I kind of more yeah, like within how we're you know with how we're going through their career, I think it's the um, the best sounding one they've done. Awake is fantastic. It's got a dark tone to it. Um, they, they, it's really kind of weird the way they recorded and mixed the bass in with it. It's kind of hard to hear, even though it's really thick. Like you can hear it, but it doesn't articulate very well. Images is crystal clear. But just so triggered, um, it just kind of has such a dated sound to it. Falling is so crisp. Um, and the guitars are, but it's so hit or yeah, miss. Yeah, from track to track. Um, yeah. You know, yeah, and and the vocals sound like he's singing in my bathroom. It's weird. So the um, this one is the most, the consistent from one end to the other, and it really kind of starts a trend with them that whether you like the production from one album to another, each one's gonna have a consistent kind of tone to it through the whole thing and you're never going to run into these problems where like where it sounds like they didn't know how to record low bass or they didn't know how to record vocal you know what it's always going to sound like they knew exactly what they were doing and what it sounded like was exactly what they intended so wow you're right the prog report i'm I'm just looking now Uh, so rolling stone in 2012 this was voted number one for your favorite prog rock album of all time in 2015, number one. the Prog Report ranked at number three on the top Mop 50 modern prog albums from 1990 to 2015. Yeah, this record, so the the story ends with, they put this record out, they went on tour, they made a live album, and this record was, it, it didn't like sell 10 million copies or anything like that, it, but this record was a big record for them. It re-catapulted, it reignited the career. I think the band kind of started a a run starting with this album that they've never really come down from. I mean, the band went from being a second tier band to, to kind of being in the same sentence as a lot of, you know, when you think of prog rock, you think of yes, you think of rush, you think of dream theater, like they get thrown in as if they're of that same ilk. This record was really instrumental in that. So I, I give them a lot of credit because they stuck to their guns and did probably what everybody would have advised them not to do. And it worked and it worked because I think they did it sincerely. And they made the hard choice. You know, they, they let somebody go. They got somebody else in the band. I mean, that, you know, it definitely wasn't the easiest thing to do. But they did it because they felt like it was the right thing to do. And I, I like that. I miss, while I might miss elements of the band, I, I don't, I like the fact that this whole last 15, 20 years has just been them doing what they think is the right thing for them, uh, not overthinking it. So, Carl, looking back, do you have a favorite song on the record? Yeah, Fatal um, Fatal Tragedy is going to be my going to be my favorite tune on here. And sure. so you saw the tour, you bought the live record. Let's talk real quick about live scenes. Uh, not only does the record get played from start to finish on there, but there's also changes. It's three disc. I mean, it's it's a big collection. Talk to me a little bit about live scenes as a kind of a companion piece to this record. You know, how do you feel about that? And do you feel like it, it does a good job of representing the band? Does a fantastic job of representing the band. Um, the, it <laughs> it does highlight some comical points with um, their, uh, how do I put this? Their singing, especially when they all sing together. Um, I don't, all right, I don't expect the other guys in a, like, I don't expect everybody in journey to sing just as well as steve perry but for some reason it doesn't sound like these guys are often on the same page and where they kind of like hang notes over from one another it sound, always sounds a little funny um to me and uh God, even even um labrie kind of makes a couple uh I would say confusing tonal choices with his voice at a couple points, but I mean, everybody hits their note. It's not bad. Um, it's a little goofy sometimes, but aside from a couple of those, um, most notably in home, the, um, this is probably my favorite collection of most of the songs they play on this album. Um, spirit carries on, uh, shoot. I even, um, I even kind of like finally free on here, but, um, when they do uh, voices, when they do Erotomania, when they do Change of Seasons, it's like my favorite versions of all three of those that they play anywhere. Um, maybe Spirit Carries On, I think on the scores, I, I like better than this one, but that's not by much. Yeah, so I mean, this record, this tour, and this live album, it kind of represents the band at their peak for a lot of people. And I kind of feel like that that's true. 
You know, and I, I think that really what they do going forward, uh, they go in different directions, but I feel like they, they kind of carry with them the momentum from this. Uh, and it gets a little divided from here on out. We're going to continue talking about their records, but the consensus is not so easily found when you get into later records. But this is kind of, we're still in that golden period. I don't think anybody says Scenes from Memory sucks. You know, it's it's a fan favorite, and for good reason. Do you have any final parting thoughts on Scenes from a Memory? Um, yeah, it's the... Um I hate this. it's like the beginning of the end for what I think of like awesome keyboard work, even though the keyboard work is awesome. Um, it just kind of goes to a level of cheese from here on out that just ain't my cheddar. Um, we don't get, we don't get lyrical. What is it? Lyrical or musical contributions from me young for a long well, time. Definitely lyrical. This is, this right? is it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of, that kind of bums me out. Um, but it is, up. Uh, it, it is to date the, greatest culminate like it, as like in their catalog um the greatest kind of culmination of what they've done some things are going to get better some things are going to get not as good and i think that's where every the kind of like the big split happens because even myself i get kind of split on some of my other favorites down the road but ultimately uh, it's always going to be a top five or i think it should be in everybody's top five who likes dream theater uh anything on the record you would change yeah i would um um, get rid of uh, through her eye or not through her eyes, Jesus. Oh yeah. Um, no, I think you mean through her I'm eyes. Going crazy here. Get rid of. Yeah, get rid oh, of no, through no. her eyes. No, no, um, <laughs> I know. <laughs> what am I thinking? No, of? You're not thinking of through her eyes. You're thinking of the the track. Uh, no, you are thinking of through her eyes. I get that. And uh, through my words. Why am I getting so stupid? No, it's not your now. fault. They like, like that, the this same is, song title. Usually, like I get stupid when we start, and I got to work out the stupid by the time I get to the end. Um, yeah, get rid of that. Get rid of a. Uh, through her eyes it sucks yeah it's horrible you know the thing i would change so when you listen to live scenes james labrie sings the verse and he doesn't sing that first verse he had the 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 vocal line kind of augments and he goes up to a higher part for like the second and third line and i always thought that was so cool and then i was listening one day uh with headphones to this record and i realized like oh they recorded him singing that way too but it's so buried in the mix you can't hear it man they should bring that up higher there's just a couple moments like that for Labrie. Uh, Strange Deja Vu has a couple moments where he's like singing these really high, cool harmony parts, but they're just, you can't even hear them. They're so low in the mix. And I feel like I get it because it was 1999 and, you know, it, it just wasn't the in vogue kind of vocal style at the time. So I could imagine like Mike Portnoy. Has it ever been? No, and that's the part I don't get. I, you know, just to touch on this real quick, this album. And this tour, and the tour that would follow, it kind of leads to the band, and mostly I think it's Mike Portnoy, kind of wanting to like make a change of the guard, not being happy with Labrie, lamenting in interviews, in press, that he's not like the singer that, you know, he's not his favorite singer, but he's the right voice for Dream Theater, or whatever. Like, it kind of begins like that, that whole thing. And the thing I've never understood, and I guess if I was gonna, if I was friends with Mike Portnoy, I would ask him like what what else do you who do you want like you have this awesome band making this awesome music and the band is the combination of the five of you so like we do you want tom york singing in your band like that would be horrible do you want russell allen from adrenaline <laughs> like do you like you want somebody else? it would just be a different band like you guys have a unique voice i would i would argue that for everybody who says they love dream theater but they hate the voice that is an asset because that is something that people remember for better or worse he doesn't just sound like you know just any other male singer he's got a very unique voice very like much like steve perry a very unique voice you either love it or you hate it and that's good because when you're playing this kind of music and there's a lot of bands doing this kind of music i feel like the vocals are almost always with deep six is progressive rock for me so the fact that they've got somebody that has this voice that can especially like on the ballads and stuff that doesn't sound like he's singing in a you know like in a musical I know. He doesn't have that. Yeah. So I just always wondered, like, what was it about this record in Six Degrees that bummed you out so much? And P.S., like, he's had some rough nights live, but, like, I've listened to every member of that band butcher songs. Like, John Petrucci butchered guitar solos, and I've never heard anybody be... And it just... Because it happens. Sometimes you just... Mike Portnoy has a tendency when he sings live to ruin Yeah, because, like, he's such a good singer. Yeah, like, honestly, it would be better if he doesn't sing on a large part of live scenes. Like, 
he's he's a very yes. pitchy singer. It just doesn't his voice doesn't mesh with Labrie, not because he's got a bad voice, just because he's like off key. And then and the, but so all of that aside, I just I've never understood the hate for Labrie. And I guess if you hate him and he's not your cup of tea, that's fine. But like you don't want a different singer in this band. You just want a different band. And so just listen to a different band. But to change singers, you just listen to Symphony X or something. Yeah. But I would argue that if this band had hypothetically changed singers after Six Degrees, it would have killed their career. I don't care who they would have got. Oh, absolutely. I don't because it would it just would have been and it would have been something dumb and somebody that they thought was like the flavor of the day. And as we all know, you know, the flavors happen to change rather quickly. So stick to your guns, do what you do, you know, leave the dance with the girl you brought and everything's gonna be fine. Uh, or, you know, take the risk and see how many of your fans stay. So I do you have any thoughts on that. I'm, I'm just kind of ranting because I've I, this topic comes up a lot when we talk about this era. Well, how how did they ever get actually get close to changing singers? Like, did they ever actually get close to they got, you know seriously consider getting rid of Labrie? They got close enough that they got him on the phone with management as a like a a surprise band meeting and basically outlined <clears throat> their grievances. Uh, many of which were just basically like you're not reliable live and your voice and you're always leaving the stage and this and that and kind of laid it out to him and then to his credit uh being kind of the cool guy that he is you know he took it all in stride and said you know what guys i'm hearing everything you're saying and i'm going to work on all that stuff that's fair i'm going to figure it out i'm going to i'm going to get in shape i'm going to lose some weight i'm going to i'm going to fix it i'm going to i'm going to be you know and he did everything that was asked of him this is you know, and then I think at that point they were like, well, you know, and I think it was very much, this is talked about in the Lifting Shadows autobiography. So Petrucci's stance was, well, you know, what else can you ask? I mean, he's doing what we've asked and that's great. And I think Petrucci's a bigger fan of his voice. And I think Portnoy was still like, ugh, you know, and so guess what? He quit. So there you go. Now he doesn't have to deal with it. Well, I guess it, it's kind of different that like, if you need to oust a band member because of, of actual practical things, like they can't do the thing that they're supposed to do, well, then that's just like a business decision, and I can't necessarily fault, fault anybody for that. If the um, if it, if it was a Mike Portnoy or whoever, I, I, I don't know for a fact, so I don't want to say that. Like, I know Mike Portnoy didn't like him, but if it was a Mike Portnoy just didn't like him and his tone and everything, that would have been the mistake. Um, you can't... Because... Like, I mean, you would have sounded so generic. Well, and with um, you know, I love Scott Ian and I love Anthrax and I love the four albums they made with John Bush, but they all, to a T, say that it was dumb that they switched singers the second it became not cool to be in a metal band because it deep sixed their career. <laughs> yeah, and, and I, I mean, honestly, it really did. I, I thought I thought the tunes and I thought the albums that they did were fantastic, but you but you would have loved right, those like records if they were called something else. I mean, the records were great. So, Scott Ian, it's 1993, yeah. and you you love alternative music. So just start a new band with John Bush on vocals and put Anthrax to bed. But right now, the reason people are buying Anthrax records and going to see Anthrax is because it's the original lineup. So. You know, they turn their back yeah. on their fans and then nobody bought the records for 10 years. So it's, you know, and, and I would argue that the band did sound cooler in 1996 with John Bush, but that didn't matter because nobody was mistaking corn for anthrax. You know, you just, when you no. try to chase that sound, no. it's like you're fooling nobody. It's like trying to chase radio play. It just doesn't work that way. So I, I'm just very glad that, that this period led to an intact band on the other side. That is that is my rant. I will stop ranting. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Geek USA. Follow us on Twitter at Geek USA Podcast. 